Hey, this is episode 7 of Stuff I Learned in the House of Bamboo. Today we're going to talk about one of the most important molecules to the majority of animals on Earth. It is, of course, dihydroxyphenethylamine, or dopamine. Dopamine acts as a neurotransmitter and hormone with multiple roles in the brain and body. We're going to focus on the brain and dopamine's role in the motivated pursuit of reward. Dopamine is synthesized in a few areas, but two are crucial. The ventral tegmental area, or VTA, and the substantia nigra. The VTA is found in the midbrain and contains densely packed dopamine neurons. The axons of these neurons travel along several pathways, with the most distinct of these being the mesocortical and mesolimbic pathways. The mesocortical pathway runs from the VTA to the prefrontal cortex and helps with motivation, executive function, and learning. The mesolimbic pathway runs from the VTA to the nucleus accumbens and other limbic structures. This seems central to learning about and processing rewarding experiences. The nucleus accumbens has two parts, a shell connected to the limbic system, helping us to determine if we subjectively like something, and a core connected to the motor system. These work together to learn about rewards and the stimuli they're associated with, then it helps us to pursue rewards and select the best action to attain them. Essentially, if we like something, it makes us approach it, and if we don't, it helps us avoid it. Right next to the VTA is the substantia nigra, dopamine hotspot number two. The substantia nigra is part of the basal ganglia, and many of its axons project to the striatum, helping to facilitate movement and learning response inhibition. It's these neurons dying that causes the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. The basal ganglia as a whole plays a role in action selection. In a situation where multiple behaviors are possible, the basal ganglia can initiate one of these behaviors by releasing it from inhibition, whilst continuing to inhibit the others. Dopamine plays two important roles in this action selection process. Firstly, it sets the threshold for initiating actions. Higher level of dopamine, lower input is required to initiate a given behavior. This is why drugs like cocaine and MDMA that block dopamine reuptake lead to, well, this. It's safe to say this man's movements are fairly uninhibited. Secondly, dopamine helps us learn. Wolfram Schultz observed that getting a reward you fully expect produces little to no dopamine. Here's that coffee you ordered, Mr. Schultz. Meh. Getting a reward unexpectedly or bigger than expected. And here's some complimentary cocaine. And you get a big dopamine signal. Getting less than you expected and your dopamine levels drop. Schultz proposed with his reward prediction error hypothesis that this discrepancy in dopamine levels is crucial to how we learn. If an action is rewarded by an increase in dopamine, the basal ganglia alters in a way that makes the same action easier to evoke in similar situations. This is known as operant conditioning. It's clear then that dopamine is crucial to how we act as individuals, but humans are social creatures, and dopamine also plays a part in how we organize our societies. Let's take two individuals, Lucy and Mike, and make them play a game. Not that sort of game. Both are given $10. The rule is, if Lucy gives her $10 to Mike, we'll triple it. So now Mike has $40. Mike then has two options. Split it with Lucy, 20-20, or steal the whole $40. Splitting will give both of them a dopamine signal, whereas stealing will leave Lucy feeling down. Mike's a jerk and steals the whole 40. We then ask Lucy if we should let Mike keep it or if we should take it away. The decision to take it causes dopamine to be released in Lucy's brain. Revenge is sweet. This shows how dopamine plays a role in enforcing social norms, etiquette, and justice. A study by Professor Elizabeth Phelps revealed how events impacting our social status affect our levels of dopamine. If you win the lottery, you'll get a dopamine signal. If you win an auction, you'll get a dopamine signal. If you lose the lottery, your dopamine will remain unaffected. It was just bad luck. But if you lose an auction, your dopamine becomes inhibited. Social subordination doesn't feel good. Then someone leans over to you and says, That guy who beat you, that's Louis the 16th. He spends all his time eating cake and drinking wine in his palace. This causes you to feel envy as your cortical regions responsible for pain perception activate. A week later, you're told the people of France were fed up of Louis and he suffered a bit of an accident. The more envious you felt of his success, the more dopamine will be released upon hearing of his downfall. This is what the Germans call schadenfreude, taking joy in someone else's misfortune. 
So is the key to keeping your brain swimming in dopamine to climb the social ladder and acquire as much wealth as possible whilst you watch the world go by with your dominant outlook? Not quite. Why? Habituation. Clyde has learned that pressing a lever three times results in a raisin and one unit of dopamine gets released in his accumbens. Then one day, Clyde gets two raisins. Boom, two units of dopamine get released, just as the reward prediction error hypothesis stipulated. But after a week of the two raisin reward, Clyde's dopamine response has returned to one unit of dopamine. We get used to things quickly. Now, if Clyde starts to only get one raisin again, his dopamine level will drop further below baseline. So we can never be fully satisfied. This seems a bit cruel, but our response to rewards must habituate with repetition in order for us to identify the next possible thing of value. It's what makes us so inquisitive. If you're fully satisfied with the two raisin reward, you might miss out on the chance for a five raisin reward. Schultz showed that our dopamine response is scale independent. Train Clyde to expect two raisins and Claude to expect four raisins. If Clyde gets four raisins and Claude gets eight raisins, they will exhibit the exact same dopamine increase, and the exact same decrease if Clyde gets one raisin and Claude gets two raisins. But dopamine isn't just about expecting rewards, it's also about pursuing them. So let's say when a light comes on, Clyde knows an experiment has started, and three lever presses equals a raisin. He's done this enough times to expect the reward, and therefore it's only accompanied by a negligible dopamine signal. But let's see what happens when the light comes on this time. Now the reward possibilities have been learned, more dopamine is released following the cue in anticipation than for the actual reward. Neurons from Clyde's amygdala, hippocampus, and prefrontal cortex automatically signal his dopamine neurons to say, the light's on, it's reward time. This is what context-dependent craving is. You've quit smoking, but every time you have your morning coffee or a pint with a friend, the potentiated synapses in your brain fire based on those cues you've associated with cigarettes, signaling your dopamine neurons. Then you get a craving. It's this effect of dopamine that ties a future reward to a positive feeling in the present that helps motivate you towards a goal, even if that goal is a fat spliff, a beer, and a cup of coffee. So yeah, that's pretty much it. If you'd like to give me a little dopamine hit, then um, hit that subscribe button. I think that releases dopamine. Uh, I haven't really done my research into it. But yeah, cheers.